and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, empaths. We hope your week is off to a great start as we're closing out the summer, which I can't believe. How, how's your summer been going so far, Denise? You know, I love, love, love this time of year, so it's perfect. Yeah, I, yeah, it's been going well. It's been very busy. We're getting ready to send my youngest off to college. So as of September, I'll be an official empty nester. Big transitions. Big transitions for sure. So you should see my house right now. I've got over the closet mirrors and organizing shelves and new comforters and sheets that'll fit their her wonky dorm bed and all sorts of fun stuff going on. But I think something else that's just exciting is I've given birth to a new book and I'm really excited to talk about it with everyone on the show this week. It's called Heavenly Alliance and it's about using, relying on your team of helpers, your guides, your angels, your ancestors to really help you manifest the life you want. And it comes out October 1st and I'm so excited. Glad that we're going to talk about this because I think a big part of it is this is your second book, which I'd love to know if that's made a difference, writing the second versus the first. But also I know that this topic is really, really near and dear to your heart. So did you find that it was comforting to write something that you do feel so passionate about? Yes, a hundred percent, because it's really everything that I'm passionate about and and believe in. And it's the idea came to me, I started writing just for fun, an epistolary novel, which it's really just emails back and forth between a soul planning to come back to earth. And she's emailing all her different guides and angels to get help on choosing her parents and her siblings. And and I, I kind of wrote it kind of tongue in cheek and funny. Like she sends an email going, wait, I just reread my soul plan. I have to get married two times. Why? Why do I have to screw it up the first time? <laughs> So I, I sent it to uh, my agent and she was like, I don't I don't cover fiction, but this would be great as a nonfiction. So I decided to write it as a nonfiction. So every every chapter starts off. Well, like the very first page of the book is a welcome letter and it just says, dear soul, congratulations, your application has been accepted to the school of Earth. And so it's every every chapter is sort of like um, what. I feel a soul would need to know as they're coming to earth. And so one chapter is on choosing your soul plan. And it's like, dear soul, okay, now that you're in the school of earth, you have to choose your guides, your angels, uh, your loved ones on the other side who will help you. And, and it talks about that. There's another chapter that's like, you know, dear soul, um, now we have to go over your soul purpose, what you want to do, what you want to learn. And there's a whole chapter on dear soul. Now it's time to recognize and figure out what your challenges will be this go around so we can grow your soul. So that's kind of how I, I I wrote it and organized it. Guidance and exercises and inspiring stories and all the other things that, that you write so beautifully. But you had mentioned before we started recording that there's two different sections to the book. And the first half really, really does a deep dive into soul plans. Could you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So I talk a lot about what is your soul plan? How do you create it? What what goes in it? Can you amend it once you're here on earth? Because that's something that I think I've talked about a lot on the show. I do believe that we live and exist here under the law of free will. But I also think a lot of things that happen in our life are pre-programmed by us, that they are pre-destined, if you will. But I don't think it's like some white guy in the sky with a beard who's saying, and now this will happen to you. I really believe that before we come to earth, our souls co-create this soul plan with our with our team of helpers. And so that's what I really wanted to get across so that people can start to look at the the crap that life has thrown them or the blessings that have just landed at their feet and start to see these events and milestones and challenges and wonderful times, all of it that have happened in their lives from this lens of, is this what my soul created? Is this what was supposed to happen to me? And I think when we 
when we look at life that way, rather than, man, life sure is just throwing some whammies my way. When we switch that to, did I co-create this? And if so, why? What am I supposed to learn from this? What are the nuggets of gold in these really difficult times I'm going through? How can I utilize these experiences to really strengthen myself and learn to love myself even more? And then once I've come through to the other side of that challenging time, how can I use it to help other people? Beautifully, beautifully said. And you touched on it just a second ago about you know, that you can, can you switch your soul plan? Can you, where does free will come into this? Where does predestiny come into this? Yeah, I definitely believe that you can amend your soul plan when you're here. And I think we do that through manifesting techniques, through prayer, through request, through really realizing that we have a lot of say in what happens in our lives. There, now, there are moments in our life, I feel, where shit's just going to go down. You know what I mean? And there's just really not anything you can do. But you always have choices in how you react to a situation. And I think there's a beautiful, beautiful, fertile energy in those difficult times where you can choose to rise above, to power through, to love and nurture yourself, to reach out to others for help. There's a whole chapter um, called Being the Hero of Your Own Story where I really compare being on earth, a student on earth to Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And I emphasize the importance of reaching out to those mentors and helpers, which is part of that, that journey story that Campbell so beautifully talks about. But I do think it's important to realize that when you feel as though you're in a rut or life is just going in a trajectory that is not in alignment with who you think you are, you can say, wait, hold on, time out. I want to change this up. I want to switch things. And I've had people who have looked at the book say to me, well, do you think that was predestined? You know, that aha moment of, mm -mm, I want to change this. And, you know, maybe, maybe so, maybe not. I don't know. I, what I do know or believe strongly is that there are little flags along the path of our life where we're meant to stop and slow down and think and ask ourselves, Am I on the right path? Is everything unfolding the way I want it to? And it's when we get to those junctures in our life path that we have that beautiful opportunity to say, yes, I'm going to power through and keep on going, or no, this is too much for me. I'm going to switch it up. And so a lot of the book is about how to recognize those flag moments, you know, where I, I compare life often to a marathon, and I think there are little helpers on the side of the road who are holding flags and bottles of water and saying, you got this, but but it's those times where we have to pause and stop and reflect, is this still my path? Is this still my dream? Is this still the goal I want to work on? And if the answer is yes, good, drink that water and you know keep on running. But if the answer is no, you either have to stop, stop running that race, take a big long time out, or take a new path, choose a new a new journey. A lot of the work that you've talked about over the years has been about connecting with your team and your spirit guides and the angelic presence. Do you feel like your the book helps people connect with uh, the whole dream team that they have, or are there different exercises to say, oh, I'm gonna, I want to connect with my guide, I want to connect with my ancestors, I want to connect with an ascended master? Is it specific yeah. or is it generalized? No, it's very, very specific. So there's a whole chapter just on connecting with your spirit guides, and then another one on working with your angels, and then another one on working with your ancestors. And I wrote it kind of like a course syllabus. So every chapter ends with homework exercises that people can take with them. Now, my editor made me change this to light lessons. That made me mad, Denise. I wanted it to be like the course. <laughs> But they they all got together and they said homework sounded too much like homework and who likes homework. But yeah, at the end of every chapter, there are exercises. I also, of course, have crystal tips in here, like fun things. I have a whole section on how to create a crystal grid, um, all sorts of things you can do. I have crystal suggestions for connecting with guides and angels. There's an exercise on creating an altar for ancestors so that you can connect more deeply with loved ones on the other side. And also recognizing 
who you should connect with on the other side right? Like you don't want to, if you have like a really, really shy grandmother who never really found her voice, is that who you want to ask for help? If you're trying to find your voice at work, Mm, maybe not. But if you had an aunt Sally who just, you know, announced her presence before she even walked in the room and everyone trembled to hear her voice because she was so, you know, loud and noticeable, maybe you want to call on her when you're trying to find your voice. So I have different tips on who you should call on as well. I love that. I absolutely love that. Do you feel like it changed your relationship with your guides and people on and folks on the other side, your team? Yeah, I think so. I definitely felt that more of them were around me and and weirdly, and I don't want to sound too out there. I don't remember writing big parts of this book and I'm not saying I channeled it. I'm really, truly not, but I did kind of just go into this zone. I had this, this lovely little hobby where I would just, you know, sit down. I had a bowl of water for energy for my, my team members. Cause I always believe that water is a conductor of energy. I had my certain crystals that I kept with me all the time when I would uh, write this. And, and I felt as though many times I was kind of told what to write. It's a collaborative effort with spirit. And if the focus is on how to connect more fully with your spirit team, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, you- it does. Hey, we're here. We're here to help. So the first half of the book really, really focuses on why we came, how we planned it out, how to make the connection. And then the second half of the book is a deeper dive into, I think you mentioned soul purpose versus soul plan. So what would be the difference between the two? So your soul plan is going to encompass everything. It's going to include the parents you chose, the siblings you may or may not have chosen, the geographical location, because that's going to impact different opportunities you're going to have. Your soul plan also includes the people that you're going to partner with, uh, have for bosses and coworkers, friends. It's going to include your challenges, your opportunities, all of that. Your soul purpose is different in that this is what you're here to really learn to do so that you can then help others. And so, you know, Denise, for years, I did soul plan readings. um, And I really enjoyed doing that. It came about in an unusual way. I had a listener email me, gosh, this is like 10, 12 years ago. And she said, "My, my mom really wants to come to you for a reading, but she's terrified. Can you just meditate on her and, and write some notes down? And so that's what I did. And when I meditated on on her mom's full name and birth date, because that helped me kind of zero in on her energy, I got a lot of information about her guides, her soul purpose, and her um, life lessons. And I included that. And, And the listener really liked it, said her mother loved it. And so she asked if I could do more for her friends and some of her family members. And I noticed that kept coming up were, you know, their guides, their um soul purpose and their life lessons. And through the years and years that I did these soul plan readings, the same type of soul purposes kept coming up, like uh, motivator, caretaker, uh, innovator, uh, teacher, creator. And so I have a whole chapter on just some of those common themes that showed up. Healer is one, uh, generational breaker is another. And I don't think we have just one of those soul purposes. You know, you could have a teacher purpose and a motivator purpose where you're here to use your voice and your talent and your experiences to teach and motivate. You can also have a creator and a generational breaker soul purpose where you're here to break a generational chain, but also use your talents as a creative person to express yourself. So it's not that we just have one soul purpose. I think we have many. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And so this all, we've talked about this a lot over the years of, you know, there are, we have helpers, they want to be there, they want to support us, ask them for signs, ask them to help you through dreams. How do you tie in our human aspect of being able to manifest by working with that team? Well, I think it's really important to get clear on what you want 
Because that's that's one of the blocks I think a lot of people have is they don't really know what they want. And so when we work with our guides and angels, they can really help us get clear on what we want. Sometimes we think we want something. Sometimes people tell us what we want. You know, we have family expectations or culture ex- cultural expectations, societal expectations. But when we give ourselves time to be silent and really go within and talk to our team, what we're supposed to do will usually be revealed to us. And sometimes it's not always that easy. Sometimes it's not that cut and dry. But when we are open and receptive to, okay, what is it that I'm supposed to do? And we talk to our guides we'll have interesting signs and synchronicities that will just pop up and let us know. Like take, for example, that whole year I spent where I would just walk to class every day and I would repeat that mantra with every footstep. God, use me to do your will. God, use me to do your will. Miracles unfold that year that I wasn't really even aware of in the moment. You know, that crystal just appeared on my desk I that bumped into that woman who told me to check out Reiki. I wandered into a bookstore and saw a sign saying Reiki class this Sunday. Like all those things just, you know, landed in my path. And I don't think any of that would have happened if I hadn't called out to my team and said, okay, what I feel something's coming, something's shifting. I don't know what it is. You have to let me know. And I don't know, maybe people have this expectation that if they meditate or pray, they're going to hear a very clear voice that says, Denise, you need to take a left on Main Street, and that will lead you to a book that's going to change your world. I don't know if they think they're going to get this very specific, clear answer, but that's not really how it happens, at least for me. When I meditate, usually I hear nothing except my own monkey mind swirling of thoughts. And I have to work on, you know, calming that down. But it's after I take time to meditate. It's after I carve out time to pray that I notice ideas will pop into my head or those things I just mentioned will just appear on my path, guiding me each and every step of the way to the next leg of my journey. Do you ever find that? I do. I do. And you have to be willing to get out of the way and allow rather than trying to control. So that if, and I mentioned this to someone recently, I said, you know, ask for a sign and then forget about it. Don't, don't look for it. And that's when spirit's able to come forward and really light your way for you a little bit more. And I love when it's unexpected and unplanned, because to me, that's more of a direct connection than if you're trying to make it happen. Yes, exactly. And and getting out of the way, I think, is often the hardest part. And yet it is one of the biggest blocks that we'll ever have to manifesting the changes that we're trying to create in our life. Um, right now, one of the so many people, and this is just a general energy and an individual energy, are feeling okay, it's time. I agreed to come and help. It's time. And in your book, you, I'm going to quote it directly. It says, now is the time to act on your dreams and invest in self-love so you can unleash the divine co-creator within you. Shine your light so brightly that illuminates the world around you and within you. You're meant to create and inspire love. Magic and miracles occur when you remember to be the light, both for yourself and others. So do you feel that this book, the timeliness of this and where we are as individuals and as a global connection is really, really important right now? I really do. I think it's more important than ever for us to connect within and connect up to something higher than ourselves so that we can realize there's so much more to this life than what we are seeing on the news or you know, all the angst and vitriol and divisive stuff that's going on right now, I think we need to really more than ever focus on the deeper meaning of life and and finding and reclaiming our purpose and why we're here. You know, I remember the first time this happened to me, I was doing a reading years ago in my, in my little office above the yoga studio. And I saw this woman in front of me. I saw that she was going to be getting pregnant soon. 
And the little soul showed me this huge line of souls waiting to come to earth. And I just never forgot that. It's I've had that image appear in other readings as well, but it really stayed with me. You know, so many of us, I don't know, we waste a lot of time complaining, you know, I don't like my job. I don't make enough money. Or did you see what's going on in the news now? Or what's going to happen in November? We get so bogged down in the minutia of life. We forget what a privilege, what an honor it is just to be on this earth, just to be living this beautiful, magical human experience. And, and I hope if my book does anything, it reminds people of not only how beautiful this world is, but how beautiful we are and how much magic and potential is within us. That's very, very inspirational and hopeful. And that's what I think we're all looking for right now is hope. Yeah. And we need to find it. We need to reclaim it for ourselves. I think many of us believe that the answer lies outside of us and it doesn't. It, it's always within us. There's there's this scene from Sex in the City where the girls go to uh, see, I think it's the New York City Fire Department dance for their calendar, you know, and they go to the coffee shop after and Miranda says, what is it with us women? Like, why do we all have a thing for firefighters? And Charlotte says, oh, it's because at, at the basis of our heart, we all want to be rescued. And that has like never left me because I thought, gosh, are we all waiting to be rescued? Rescued from our sad childhood mem memories, rescued from our crappy job, rescued from our failing relationship, rescued from our health issues, rescued from our anxiety or whatever. And I think if anything I've learned, we have to rescue our own damn selves. Well, that's when you were speaking, that's what I was thinking is, yes, waiting to be rescued also keeps you in a perpetual loop tape as being a victim. And your book is giving people a guide to say, you don't have to stay in a victimized state. You don't have to feel helpless and be rescued because the support of the universe is here to help you. And then you can resonate at a higher frequency and attract in at that frequency, yeah. which is incredible. And, you know, you end the book and I love that you named part two of the book, the school of life is you end it with the secret language of the universe. So is that just in how you may perceive or receive signs and symbols and, and messages? Yeah, it's the signs, the symbols, the messages, the coincidences, the synchronicities, all of those things. It's the inner intuitive nudges, those aha moments. It's the way the universe talks to us because something that bothers me is I have a lot of people in my life who struggle with their faith and, and struggle with, you know, God, goddess, creator, not answering their prayers. And, or they struggle with hearing nothing from their guides and angels when they're going through a dark night of the soul. And I know I've been there, you know, I've definitely had my share of dark nights of the soul and reached out and, and heard nothing in return. And one of the things that my guides will consistently show to me when they do deign to talk to me, uh, but the most, one of the most impactful they showed me was someone taking a test. And think about it when you were in school and you had to take a test and you forgot the answer, if you raise your hand and ask the teacher for the answer, and she or he just gave you the answer, sure, you'd ace the test, but you would have learned nothing. I think life is a test. And the reason why our guides and angels can't answer us when we're going through those big, heavy, dark nights of the soul is because if they just gave us the answer, we'd learn nothing. And we're not, you know, we're not here to be the main character of an amazing, happy, romantic Hallmark movie, we're, we're here to learn and to grow and to evolve. And that involves struggling and figuring out as, as we go on our own alone. But that doesn't mean we're alone. Just like when you're taking that test and you can't remember the answer, the teacher's still there, but she just can't give you the answers. I think it's it's a helpful way to look at it because that's that's where I think a lot of people lose their way on this journey of life is they think about how how many times they've reached out to a god figure and and received nothing in return. 
first of all, I, I don't think that's true. I think if you if you look back, you know, hindsight is everything, you'll see that there really was a lot of help there. But I also think people don't look back. They don't take the time to pause. And all they think about is the difficult times that they've had to experience. And there's been no big a breakthrough of an angel appearing or or a guide saying exactly what you know you need to hear at that moment. And they lose faith and then they just kind of go through life. I've I've noticed, Denise, I feel like a lot of people die years before they die. All the time. Yeah. And and you can see it. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in in the way they talk. You can oh one of the stories I I think I have it in this book. I remember I was teaching my students, you know, Hemingway, there's this, there's a famous English, any English teacher is going to roll his or her eyes and go, yes, Samantha, we all know this assignment. But one, one time Hemingway was tasked with writing a short story in six words. And so he wrote, baby shoes for sale, never worn. And it's such a great example of Hemingway because, you know, of course it's six words, but you know so much in what he said, you know, why are there baby shoes? Why are they for sale? And why were they never worn? Anyway, so a common English assignment is to ask people to write their life story in six words. It's a, it's the way I used to always kick off narrative writing and students would write some pretty fun things. I did this with some family and friends who were over for dinner and one person who was just so exhausted with work and was just working six, seven days, 12 hour days and was just, you know, not feeling it. And this person wrote, um, he, he said, I, I can write my life story in three words, rinse and repeat. And that just made me so sad because he had gotten to that point where he felt that all work was was just getting up, going to work and coming home, rinse and repeat, you know? And yet I see people like that all the time. They just go through life. They just go to work and they pay their bills and they come home and they watch TV and they've just kind of died a little bit before they actually died. And, and I think it's because they've given up that, that faith, that hope that they are here for a purpose, that being alive is such a gift and a privilege that there are millions of souls waiting to come here just to have the mundane and the amazing experiences that we're having each and every day. And I just, I really hope that this book reminds people of that. Well, it seems like you're giving people the tools to make a stronger connection, not only with spirit, but with themselves. And that ties in with having a more enhanced experience while we're here on the planet, because I saw this the other day and it really I'm going to paraphrase it and I can't give credit to whoever wrote it, but it was just talking about as you continue to, to grow and evolve and learn and be curious and explore, that's aging gracefully. That is embracing that the life you came here is still worth living, which goes along beautifully with what you were just saying in that I think some people get to a certain stage in their life and they just start to tap out. And sometimes it's it's non-negotiable and health gets in the way or there's financial stress and strain that, that really limits what they're able to do. But often I think we do it to ourselves. And maybe with your book, you can help people gain insight into having more of a connection so that they'll realize, oh, I still do have a lot here to experience and learn and and be in a place of love and gratitude with it. Yeah, and I and I don't even mean to be disparaging. I mean, if anyone listening to this feels as though they've kind of given up and are just going through the motions of life, there's always hope to change that around. And there are going to be times in your life. I mean, just if you're dealing with a chronic physical ailment, that's that's energy draining on every single level. If you're going through a relationship ending, a big career change, financial stress, like you were saying before, those are all heavy things where sometimes all you can do is rinse and repeat to get through your day, right? Yeah. All I'm saying is everyone needs to remember that we are going to rescue ourselves. We're going to do it through action, but also through inner prayer and meditation and request and appeals for help and assistance. And we're also going to do it through a lot of faith and hope and, and love and belief in ourselves. 
And I think if if everyone can recognize the power that lies inside of our thoughts, inside of our words, and inside of our imagination, if everyone could grasp the power that lies in those three things, words, thoughts, and imagination, the whole world would be different. And it's what we need. It's another example of the more comfortable you can feel with yourself and connect with other people on that same intrinsic level of humanity, it's going to help shift away from the dark, the fear, the the control, the uncertainty of where this is all leading. Yeah. But I don't think a lot of people give themselves even that, that grace of time needed to reflect on what they want. You know, I, I have a friend who's getting ready to retire at the end of the year. And I said, what are you, what are you going to do? Like, what are you, what are your plans? And she said, I'm just going to put my feet up and do whatever the heck I want. And I said, no, that's awesome. But what is it? What, what do you want? And she said, I, I don't know. And I, I was like, okay, well, do you have any goals? Like, do you want to travel anywhere? Do you want to take any classes? Are you going to like, I don't know, revamp your house or organize stuff? And she was like, I don't know. And she just really hadn't thought about it. And like, maybe, you know, maybe there's something good to that. But I always think like, first of all, I, I've told you before, I don't want to retire. I think that's boring. And I feel like retirement would be fun for a year, but then what, you know? And I worry about people who don't have those one, three, or five-year plans, who don't know really what they want, or even what they're trying to manifest, you know, or aren't even taking the time to look at themselves as a soul, as a student of earth here to learn and grow and teach and help and evolve. Perhaps this could be a beautiful stepping stone for that, for people who may need even the initial first steps of how do I get onto that path and start moving in that direction? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of it comes with realizing that you really do have the whole team around you of, of helpers. And when you learn to call on them and when you learn how to call on them and who to call on, I think you can really start to see some momentum build up in your life that will help you affect really, really powerful change. I mean, I've been using these techniques I outlined in this book for over 20 years, and I've used these techniques to help me manifest Uh, my pregnancies, my jobs, these books, um, my love, everything. And all the manifesting techniques I've used have changed my life in huge, tremendous ways for the better. See, the proof is in the pudding, right? It is. (laughs) But I also have a whole chapter on uh, fears and, and really learning to recognize what your inner fears are, what your what your shadow, like who your shadow is and what your shadow side is trying to teach you and illuminate for you. Because that's something else that I think we've seen a lot in our line of work is how powerful the illusion of fear is and how many of us use our fears as excuses to hold our light back. And, and I think what we need to do is shine a light on our fears, befriend our fears, Uh, Make your shadow your best friend so that you can recognize exactly what it is that that might be holding you back. And, you know, one of the stories I tell in the book, I was I was at um, I was at a conference presenting and I was really nervous about it. And I had a I had a great time and it went really well. And while I was there, I also got some really good news. And so I called um, my my now fiance, Michael, uh, to tell him all my good news. And and I just kind of like skipped through it, you know, and I know, you know what I mean, Denise, because you do this too. I think I was just kind of like, yeah, this went well, that went well. And then I got this good news. Anyway, how are you? <laughs> and he <laughs> said, he said, no, no, do not, do not do that. Do not say any way. Don't do it. He said, just sit there, unpack this, you know, let's just revel in this good news and celebrate you. It felt so uncomfortable. I actually like, I, my, I actually like moved 
like my, I remember like moving my shoulders, like trying to shrug off that feeling. Do you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 I'm good. Tell me about your day. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when I hung up the phone and I was sitting in that hotel room alone, I was thinking like, why am I so afraid to, you know, kind of brag about, I, I'm so uncomfortable bragging about myself. And I, and I realized that one of my shadows is that I was, I'm afraid to shine my light. I'm afraid to look, you know, cause I think being humble is so important. It's part of the ethics of doing the work you and I do. And no one had ever given me permission as a kid to brag about myself. And so I had to really make friends with that part of myself and tell her it's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm going to be your cheerleader and I'm going to show you that it's, it's okay to celebrate yourself. But that, that was only if, like a year and a half ago that I learned that one. But There's always so much to learn. There's always more shadows to unpack. <laughs> there are, but if you're, if the premise is to love yourself, build a, a stronger connection and live the life you really came here to live, it seems like you need to have that sense of self and that sense of being able to say, I deserve this. I've worked really hard. I love that I've done the work to be able to have this connection with spirit. And now I can share that with other people. Yeah. Yeah. And I talk a lot in the book too about the power of surrender, how sometimes there are going to be situations that maybe you can't manifest, that maybe you can't achieve, that, you know, maybe, maybe there are some dreams that you have to let go of. But I always feel like it's for now. It's not forever. Right? There's there's a season to everything in our life. And we can't awfulize everything. You ever heard that expression? <laughs> you know, we make everything awful or always and never. We can't do that when we're in good times. And we can't do that when we're in bad times either. We have to recognize that there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything and nothing lasts forever. This too shall pass. So we have to learn to embrace the good moments, but also tolerate the not so good moments and surrender to them but it's a very careful balance that surrender, isn't it? Because we have to surrender with this knowledge that the universe is always working for us, with us, not against us. And that everything that is happening is not happening to us. It's happening for us. And it's really hard to recognize that in the moment, it really is. But when we do take that time to journal, to talk to someone, to discuss it with our guides when we're meditating or going on our walk. I love to talk to my guides when I when I go for walks. That's very helpful to me. I call it active meditation, but it's really more just me rambling at my guides. But it helps me process a lot of the things that I'm going through, the challenges that I'm experiencing, so that I can see what is the gold nugget of truth in there I'm supposed to learn. There's always, there's always something we're supposed to learn. That's why I wanted to make the whole book like a course curriculum, because I think once we, once we switch our focus from, you know, just life to, oh, I'm in school, I think it really helps us reframe our challenges in more positive ways. And you have covered so much in this book that even if someone is a little more seasoned or just a beginner, there is something that would resonate with everyone that could pick it up. Because it, it may be deepening a connection you already have, or it may be making that initial connection. But either way, it's going to lead you to, as you said, increased self-awareness, which is what so many of us are looking for, and a way to step more fully into your power, your light, and your purpose with what's coming up for you in your life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I hope it's given everyone a lot of hands-on tools and tips and techniques. I have a lot of metaphysical fun things people can do to work on their manifesting, to connect deeper with their guides. But I also have a lot of deep healing exercises, like some forgiveness and cord cutting stuff that I think is so, so crucial. And then there's, of course, just 
really great tips in there for recognizing what your soul purpose is and recognizing how the universe is trying to work for you and with you so that we don't just kind of rinse and repeat our way through life. So well said. Oh, thank you, Denise. And so the, um, the book comes out October 1st. I'm very excited. My sister is throwing me a huge uh, book launch party, Denise. So I'm I'm really going to have to befriend that shadow and <laughs> <laughs> be comfortable uh, being in the spotlight that day. Because I think most listeners have heard my sister, Courtney, on the show. She's such an extrovert. And she's like, we're going to have a photographer and we're going to have this cake. And we're going to, I'm like, okay. A little nervous about that, but it comes out uh, October 1st and stay tuned. I'll announce on the show and on my newsletter and on uh, social media, my website, I am going to offer a lot of fun pre-order incentives. Uh, For example, if you pre-order the book and send me um, your receipt number, you will get to join my workshop on connecting with your guides and angels for free. But I'm also trying to record some of the meditations so I can offer those to people who pre-order the book. So I'll announce that more as I get that all organized and set up and ready to go. What a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. And, And your generosity to share all the extra stuff is just indicative of why this is this has been such an important book for you to write. Oh, thank you, Denise. I really, I really cannot wait uh, to share it with everyone. And if you go to Enlightened Empaths, you'll see I posted a copy of the the cover of the book, um, Heavenly Alliance. And I'm I'm just so excited to share it with everyone. So thank you for giving me this time to talk about it. Oh, we love it. We all love it. We're looking forward to reading it and sharing it with each other and you know, just keep doing you because it's working and you're you're really lighting the way for so many people right now. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Please remember, as always, to show up, do great work and share your light.